A short time ago, I stood there in the loneliest place on the planet, the top of the bottom of the world, the South Pole. I stood there with my two teammates, with my two friends, Ray Zahab and Richard Weber, after breaking the world record for the fastest unsupported trek from the edge of the Antarctic continent to the geographic South Pole. We made the 1,130 kilometer journey in 33 days, 23 hours, and 55 minutes, shaving almost six days off the previous fastest mark. Careful, <laughs> my time. <laughs> but uh, getting to the South Pole had been a dream of mine for my whole life. And uh, to be honest with you, it was a dream I never thought I'd realize. You see, I grew up an inner city kid in Montreal to parents that knew nothing of outdoor adventure. Ours was very much an urban existence. We didn't even own a car. So why the dream? Well, I can only attribute it to something that happened almost four decades ago. That's how old I am. <laughs> and it was a regular evening out with my folks. And um, it was a snowstorm in Montreal, and it was February. My brother and I became separated from my parents in a department store in the center of town, and it was closing time. And this overzealous security guard decided to just kick us out rather than actually help us find our parents. I was nine years old, and my brother was five, and we had no money. And I still remember that moment of fear and anxiety and trepidation, realizing, Jesus, i got to get us home here. And I didn't even know where home was. Well, four hours later, I did get home with my baby brother in hand, to a waiting squadron of cop cars. <laughs> it was the scariest moment in my life, but it was also the most exhilarating. It wasn't long after that that I became fixated on the idea of actually going to the South Pole. <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm very much a regular guy. I'm happy, happily married to a beautiful woman. I have two gorgeous kids, and uh, I have a small business here in town where my clients allow me to explore my passion for West Coast contemporary architecture. It's just that I have this craving for adventure. Back in 1997, uh, Frank Wolf and I would run the West Coast Trail, Jerry, um, uh, in, a, in a day, in actually just 10 hours, in fact, 10 hours, 13 minutes, five minutes slower than Gary. And uh, <laughs> there you go. And um, a lot of people thought we were mad, saying we're moving way, way too fast to see anything. But nothing could have been further from the truth. It was like the slowing down of time during an accident. I perceived everything with this heightened sense of clarity. Let's face it, we all forgot what we did last week, or yesterday for that matter. But we all remember that first time we rode a bike, and we all remember that first time we had sex. Well, it was one of those moments, hyper-intense moments, and I wanted more of this. In 1999, Andy Stearns, uh, Dave Nerona, and myself would ski the length of Alaska's 1,860-kilometer Iditarod Trail. And this was my first major expedition, and uh, it really sort of gave me a, a taste of how hard it got out there. And on day 20, in a tiny village of Nolato, nestled on the frozen Yukon River, I told my story to this little four-year-old named Kelvin, and he was fascinated by what we were doing. And I took it all on board, and then he asked me the question. He hit me with it, in fact. What was, what was I looking for? And I couldn't answer him, and that question just hung there for me for the rest of the expedition. In fact, that hung around my neck for the next 10 years. I cycled uh, the length of Java, Indonesia, attempting to summit all its 10,000 foot volcanoes in the midst of a jihad. I'd actually hack my way through northern Borneo, um, uh, retracing the infamous Sendakan Death March for the first time since World War II. I followed jungle patrollers, some of these guys atop huge Asian elephants, hunting poachers and illegal loggers in Sumatra, Indonesia. I went up to the Canadian High Arctic and retraced the footsteps of Sir John Franklin's doomed expedition to find the Northwest Passage. But through it all, uh, his question, little Kelvin's question just sat there with me. I couldn't answer it. Well, my South Pole expedition did answer it for me. I'm a partner in an organization called Impossible to Possible, or I2P. And the South Pole Quest Adventure was our inaugural expedition. 
We were connecting to thousands of school kids across North America via an interactive live website where these kids could email us. So we were uploading images, we were uploading voicemail, uh, voice blogs, we were answering their emails. The kids just loved it. They were just fascinated by what we were doing and they peppered us with questions. Like, what do you guys eat out there? Well, we were eating slabs of deep fried bacon and chunks of frozen butter in a desperate attempt to keep our caloric intake up above 8,000 calories a day. And I'd still lose 20 pounds on that expedition. Now, I'm going fast here. In the next picture after this, you'll see where I'm biting into a chunk of frozen butter where it actually broke my front tooth off or in half. <laughs> Another question, um, what wildlife do you see out there? Well, there is no wildlife in Antarctica. Uh, there's a half inch insect that lives on some distant peak that eats bacteria. We were truly the only, only life on Antarctica and in Antarctica, uh, three beating hearts on this big slab of ice. And probably a good thing too, because we were stuck in the same underwear for the entire expedition. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, the light bulb went off when a, a young offender from the Riverside Resolve Detention Center in Illinois sent me uh, an email. And uh, you've got to understand, this is a strike two kid, meaning one more mistake, and this kid gets booted up to adult court and goes to jail for good. And he hit me with the question at a particularly tough time. I, I mean, I was emotionally and physically drained, shattered. The, I mean, the crushing reality of what I got myself into was finally dawning on me. I was at my wit's end. And he, I just read the email, it was so simple, like, how do you guys keep going? Why don't you quit? Well, right then I knew the answer to it all, to the bigger question for me. We were reaching this kid. I mean, we're talking about a kid who very few people could reach. He was engaged with what we were doing. He was inspired by our expedition. Well, by the end of the expedition, we would record over 1.5 billion media impressions. We were clearly reaching people out there. And up to this point, I've been doing all my expeditions in a vacuum of sorts, for personal reasons, I, I mean, for wonderful reasons, but I knew there was something else. Well, I'd found it. I wanted to use my expeditions to inspire young people. I want to use my expeditions to inspire young, young people to pursue their dreams. So finally, when I got to the South Pole, I was ecstatic. I mean, I just realized my childhood dream, and hell, we broke the world record getting there. But in the end, I discovered something profoundly more important for me. You know, in the end, I'm just a dad, and I have two kids and two girls, and all I want for them, what I want for all kids, is just to have the confidence and courage to pursue their dreams. Thank you. <laughs>